Well, good morning. For those of you who uh, are visiting this morning, we're glad that you decided to make this your uh, destination this morning at, on Thanksgiving weekend. And I know a lot of you are heading out this afternoon to go off to family events and tomorrow. I hope that you enjoy your Thanksgiving and the time that you spend with the family. We are uh, going to be starting a new series called Legacy in the next seven weeks. Uh, last year, around this time, we took a crack at uh, nine messages on the first half of the book of Romans, and this year, we're going to go into discovering more about who God is in the book of 2 Timothy. I think we still, there we are, uh, 2 Timothy. So I'm going to be preaching a series of messages uh, from the, this pastoral letter. But I want you to put yourself uh, in a frame of mind. I want you to think about this for a minute. If you were to leave a legacy, what would it be? Right? If you could, uh, if you could write it down yourself. I don't know if you've maybe done this before or not, but we, used to, we did this uh, in high school, I think, or something. If you had to write something on your tombstone, what would it be? Yeah. Would it, would it be uh, reflective of the lives that you have impacted? Or would it be reflected of the monuments that you've built? Which one would be more valuable to you? When you're gone, when life has taken you and you're in glory in heaven, what is it that you want to be known for or remembered for with the people that are left behind? I think it's a really important question to ask because it sets the motivations for a lot of what we do every day. But too often we don't think about it. Right? We don't take time to reflect. I want you to put yourself into this person's shoes. I'm going to share with you some images. And what I want you to do is I just want you to think that you're in this situation, that you're standing in the crowd, and this is happening. Sunlight gleams off the polished blade of the executioner's sword. His bound victim kneels before him with head bowed. Despite being emaciated and exhausted from mistreatment, the condemned man is still fully alert, completely aware of his imminent death. Yet it's not fear that grips him. It's concern. Concern for a young man hundreds of kilometers away would his protege, a young pastor, whose task it would be to carry on the leadership of one of the largest churches in the empire, prove steadfast? Would he resist the cunning and false teachers who are even now leading many in his church astray? Would he work diligently to raise up new leaders even when others betray him? Would he continue to proclaim the gospel even under the threat of an executioner's sword? Could you imagine being in the crowd and having a window into that person's mind? That person is the Apostle Paul. He has lived his ministry career. He is at the very end. The Bible tells us that this is probably, well, the scholars tell us that this is the last thing that he wrote. It's a letter that he penned to his protege, Timothy. Paul was a Pharisee. He grew up in a Jewish home. He was a Roman citizen by birth because he was born in Tarsus. He came to Jerusalem and stood by while he saw over the persecution, the death, the martyrdom of some of the first Christians. He stood there and gave his blessing to it, and God struck him on the Damascus Road. Some of you may have heard of uh, somebody's testimony of faith, a Damascus Road experience. It was powerful. It literally knocked him over. God came to him on this road, blinded him, and then he has to go and find this man on, 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 on uh, State Street, I think it was called, I don't know, Straight Street, thank you, Straight Street, who then lays hands on him, and he restores his sight. Paul then goes on to a journey of training, of coming to terms with the fact that he has been fighting against Jesus, and Jesus appears to him, and he says, okay, I'm going to give my life to this. And for three years, he goes off <clears throat> in Syria, and he begins this journey of, of coming to terms with his character, with his beliefs, and exercising his gifts. 
Another year or so gets placed in the church in Antioch where Barnabas comes to him and says, "Uh, Paul, we want you to teach now in Antioch. And can you imagine the believers there as they saw this man, Paul, coming who'd persecuted them? And now he's teaching them about the grace of Jesus Christ. Paul is the most prolific missionary that ever lived. He planted dozens of churches. He went on three missionary tours. He rose, uh, raised up leaders. He set them off on a trajectory to go and proclaim the gospel. <clears throat> In his last missionary journey, he camps out at Ephesus for three years. And he stays in one spot for three years so that these people, protégés, potential preachers of the gospel, Timothys, can come and listen and be taught. And Paul's relationship with Timothy is very, very close. And Paul, now being arrested in chains in Rome, waiting for his execution. We, we know from church historians that Paul was beheaded shortly after writing this letter. And you start to imagine now the mindset of this letter as it's written to Timothy. If there's anything I want to say, I want to put it down in these words. I want to get it out on this paper, and I want to share this with this young man who I've been built such a close relationship to. Titus, Timothy, and Luke are the ones we hear about most often. But Timothy, Paul doesn't talk to, about anyone else the way he talks about Timothy. And I want to read to you the first chapter. And I want you to listen with that heart, with that That thought process, this description in the back of your mind, listen to how he speaks to this young man, Timothy. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I have been sent out to tell others about the life that he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. I'm writing to Timothy, my dear son. Now, he was not actually a son. But you start to understand the closeness in this relationship. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. Timothy, I thank God for you. The God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again. For I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I remember that your genuine faith... For you share the same faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know the same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength that God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. For God saved us, and he called us to live a holy life. And he did this not because we deserve it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. And God chose me to be a preacher, an apostle, a teacher of this good news. That's why I'm suffering here in prison. But I'm not ashamed of it. For I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. Hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you learn from me, a pattern shaped by the faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. As you might know, Everyone from the province of Asia has deserted me, even Phygias and Hermonides. May the Lord show special kindness to Onesiphorus and all his family because they often visited and encouraged me. He was never ashamed of me because I was in chains. When he came to Rome, he searched everywhere until he found me. May the Lord show him special kindness on the day of Christ's return. And you know very well how helpful he was in Ephesus. Can you hear that? Can you hear the the emotion 
and the strong sense of connection between this older man and this young man, Timothy. A mentoring relationship, you might call it. A coaching relationship. Certainly, dear friends, Timothy, my dear son, he says. It's almost like Paul is writing his last will and testament, his spiritual last will and testament. These are the things that I want to tell you, Timothy. If there are things about the spiritual life that we have chosen, here they are. And he begins with this chapter in 2 Timothy. I think the first thing that jumped out at me as I read this first chapter was Paul's statement about being saying, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of me when I was in chains. Uh, Anissa Ferris and his family, they weren't ashamed. They came looking after me. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. We hear this over and over again in verse 8. Put that on the screen. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord and don't be ashamed of me either. For God has called us to live a holy life. That's the next verse. You know, I learned to stop swearing when I was about 25. Um, I don't know, maybe those of you who are over 50, you, you look back on your life and you think to yourself, I was pretty rough around the edges when I was 25. Can anybody say that? Is there a few amens in the house? Yeah. I was pretty rough around the edges when I was 25. And I needed to learn to stop swearing. Now, how this happened was uh, we were driving down the road. AJ was beside me. I was in the driver's seat driving down the road. And this guy cuts me off. And usually out of my mouth would come some kind of profanity. And I would say something, you know, along the lines of, you stupid cow manure. Well, I didn't use cow manure, obviously. But before I could say it, it came from the back seat where the kids were. I'm not telling. <laughs> Three of them are here, so you two choose. <laughs> and my wife, AJ, she looked directly at me and she said, we need to change our language, which was her way of saying, you need to change your language. <laughs> right? Because they're watching us. They're watching us. Being someone in the situation like Paul and Timothy is, is that over and over and over again, we have to not be ashamed of the gospel message because people are watching. The whole purpose of this letter to Timothy is to say, be careful. Hold on to those things that are dear to you, your faith. The hemorrhaging faith study, which came out about 10 years ago, looked at uh, young adults and why they, if coming from Christian homes, why they are not going back to church when they leave home. And one of the most significant things that we found in that study is that young adults don't go to church because they didn't see and hear the gospel at home. Mom and dad brought them to church, most likely, even brought them to youth group, but the main reason they didn't go back is because they never saw or heard the gospel at home. Do not be ashamed of what you believe in. Parents, you have this enormous responsibility to pass on what you know. Character formation is incredibly important. But spiritual formation is extremely important. And as grandparents, I, I get a chance to... Do it all over again. And even dip into that whole idea about what it means to not be ashamed of the gospel. You're going to be at work and you're going to be at school. You're going to have an opportunity to speak out on what you believe in. To say something about where you're going this weekend. To talk to someone about what you're thankful for. And include the message of the gospel, the hope of the world that Jesus Christ loved you enough to die on the cross to pay for your sins. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. I think the second thing is around character development. Now, when my kids were little, I had to hold on to them pretty closely, right? Fragile, 
We're at a house yesterday, and my little granddaughter, Aria, is trying to stand. And everybody's kind of crowded around, waiting for the moment when she's going to top all over. And as parents, when the children are little, we want to protect them as best we can. We're close. But as they get older, they start to need some freedom. They start to need spaces and places where they can practice and model the behavior that they are seeing at home. That's why it was so important that we change my language at the house. When you give your child some freedom, it also gives them a chance to grow in their understanding of what it means to be good, to be loving and kind, patient, to stand up for bullies. And as they continue to get older, our hold on them continues to loosen. And as it does into the teenage years, character formation happens when they can practice the lessons that are taught. And eventually, we let them go. We let them go into God's hands. Character formation is probably one of the most significant things that you can do with your child. In first, it's 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, it says here, Paul is saying to Timothy, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that the same faith continues strong in you. You have a responsibility. If you are a parent, if you are an auntie or an uncle, if you have friends who you stand next to in doing life, you have a responsibility to make sure that we point out good character. Character allows a person to grow and form. It was interesting. We um, had a conversation this week with the ministers in our region. Twelve of us were there from the Christian Reformed Church, and we were talking about what does it mean to be a leader in the church. And you could think about all kinds of kinds of things that we would do as a leader, that we would, you know, the, do certain kinds of strategies and sort of vision and all that kind of stuff. But in the end, the conversation boiled down to character. To be a great leader means to have great character. Because when you get squeezed, what comes out is character. When the pressures of life put its hold on you, when the pressures of your job, of being a parent, or hanging out with a group of friends, when the pressure is on, character is what squeezes out. Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Is it courage? Is it strength? Paul says to Timothy, you have received an incredible blessing by being raised in a home that knew Jesus. And for those of you who are parents here today, and you think to yourself about the role that you play with your children, character formation around the characteristics of Jesus Christ are extraordinarily important. Do they love like Jesus loves, not like I love, because my love is flawed? Do they care for people like Jesus cares for me, not like how I care for people, because I'm not that good at it all the time? Character formation is extraordinarily important. As a matter of fact, I would go so far, and that's a whole other rabbit trail, which I don't want to go down, but I would go so far as that if a leader gets stuck, it's not about skill. It's about character. Are there triggers in their life, things that keep them from moving forward? Are there uh, lessons that still need to be learned? Is someone uh, behaving in in a maturity way that's not reminiscent of an adult? but more as a teenager or a child. Character is extraordinarily important. And I think that the third thing that I see in this chapter as we look at the life of Paul and Timothy is that he encouraged the use of the gifts that Timothy had. Verse 6, This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God has given you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of love, power, love, and self-discipline. I think Paul was a bit worried about Timothy's fear and timidity. I think from this space, when he's looking at the executioner's blade, he wants to prompt Timothy in a way to say, Timothy, don't let those old habits, those old fears, those old ways of life, rule you. Make sure that your life is, is full of power.
power, love, and self-discipline. I uh, watch a YouTuber uh, quite regularly. Uh, his name is Sean James, and he has a channel called My Self-Reliance. It turns out that he lives in Barrie. Uh, he's a woodsman, so to speak, built his own log cabin without power tools, uh, sauna, outdoor kitchen, hunts regularly. I, I just love watching it. It's just really good. One of the things that he does on a regular basis is, though, is he makes a cooking fire um, out of wood, and he has a cooking outdoor kitchen, so he's always making food. But if you watch him do it, there are a couple of components of making a fire that are always there. One is wood, another is tinder, another is a spark, and the fourth one is oxygen. Without one of these three, or these four, it's really difficult to start a fire. And so he would uh, put the wood on the fire, he would get the tinder, a little, usually wood shavings or, you know, moss or some birch bark, and then strike a flint on steel in order to get the spark. But then you would see him pick up that little uh, thing of tinder, and he would just blow on it, just a little bit. And without that little extra breath, that spark usually went out. And Paul's looking at Timothy and saying, it's all there, Timothy. All your gifts are right there. You know how to teach. You know how to proclaim the gospel. You know what you need to do in order to grow. I'm asking you to just blow on those things that you already have. Fan into flame the gifts that God has given you. Allow the Spirit of God to overcome and overwhelm you. The power of the Spirit of God. Because Paul knew what he was doing. Paul knew right here in this passage in verse 11. And he says, and God chose me to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of this good news. And Paul says to Timothy, I'm going to you know, fan into flame those gifts that I've given you. Or those gifts that I prayed over for you. He says, I laid hands on you. It's not the, you know, I'm going to bless you, my son kind of laying out of hands. It's the blessing, I want to bless you, kind of laying out of hands. It's this way of of highlighting what is true in Timothy's life. All right. How do we go about doing this maybe in our own lives? Maybe you're asking yourself the questions that are really important. What am I going to leave behind? All throughout this series, what I want to do is I want to talk with you through about what it means to leave a legacy, a legacy of faith. And I think one of the things that's absolutely crucial in all of this is how well you know your Bible. Because how well you know your Bible is going to be the measure to which that you can influence spiritually the people around you. Uh, By the way, uh, those of you who are in a grow group, anybody in a grow group here today? Come on, you can put your hands up. Shame the others who are not. Uh, (laughs) Go be in a grow group. Be in a small group of some sort. Leslie's did a fantastic job of writing this material. Yeah. Would you just say thank you to me for it? One of the great things about this material is that it's uh, Bible-based in the sense that there's reading scriptures and then talking about the Bible verses. Reading a Bible versus talking about them. And all throughout the week, she's given you opportunities to do that. Reading the Bible is the way that you are going to be most prepared to pass on your faith to the people in your life. When I first was a youth pastor in uh, Fremont, Michigan, I uh, did what was called, um, oh, well, it's not what it was called. I did a Bible knowledge survey, and I was just trying to figure out where the kids were. I got there. It's the first time I was there. I figured, okay, I need to have some kind of gauge as to how much Bible that they know. And kind of on the last minute, I put uh, two questions at the top. One was, how often does your family read the Bible, or how often do you read the Bible each week? And I gave a graph of 1 to 10. And then I asked the question, how often does your family pray together, or do you pray per week? And I gave a 1 to 10. Christian school kids, public school kids, a whole bunch of differences in their family upbringing. But the one common denominator in Bible knowledge was how often families read their Bibles together and prayed together. Didn't matter if you went to Christian school or not, although they did do marginally better than those who didn't. But it's the same thing for you. We're sitting at the Alpha course this week, and somebody asked the question, you know, 
I really do need to know the Bible better. And I think what I need to do is to spend more time reading my Bible. But it's, you know, it's hard to, to know everything that you need to know. And I said, well, I said, it's a matter of reading the scriptures. And I said to this lady, I said, right behind me, there's a man with gray hair who's at the other table leading a group. I said, he knows his Bible way better than I do. It's because he reads it every day. And that guy's sitting right in the far corner. He didn't go to Bible school. He just read his Bible every day. And I'm asking you, if you want to leave a spiritual legacy behind, if you want to be able to influence someone for the faith, if you want to be able to point out the Spirit of God, the fingerprints of God on someone's life, read your Bible, allow God to speak to you, and allow that to fill your life and your heart so that you're able to see with the eyes of the Scriptures. Allow God to do that. And practice character. Maybe some of you are sitting here today thinking, you know what, um, I kind of get the, the whole idea about the stopping swearing thing. Or maybe it's something else, that uh, you, the language that you use at home or the actions and behaviors you have with your spouse or how you uh, spend your time on the weekends with your friends. Maybe some of that needs to change. Because if I want to leave a spiritual legacy, people are going to be watching me and what I do. And then don't be shy. Don't be shy with the gospel. Here's a very practical thing. You're going to go and spend time with your family today and tomorrow. And when they say, which they inevitably will, somebody will say, what are you thankful for? Share the message of the gospel. I'm thankful for Jesus and for being a role model for me. I thank you for my faith. I'm grateful for my faith and what God has done. I'm so grateful for how God has answered prayers in my life. And I really want to see him more fully in the life that I lead. That would be bold, wouldn't it? That would be something to talk about afterwards. What is the legacy that you're going to lead? Leave behind. Anybody heard of the uh, amazing Randy? He's kind of like a mentalist, uh, magician. Anybody ever heard of this guy? No, not that one. <laughs> That's for Johnny Carson. That's like really old school, Wayne. Come on. This guy is actually pretty recent. Uh, in Niagara Falls, he was hung upside down in a straight jacket, and he managed to get out of it. And they put him in a block of ice, and he managed to escape from a block of ice. And in, in uh, England, they put him in a coffin in a pool, and he spent five hours in this coffin breathing the air that was in there, and then was still, still survived afterwards. But what he does now is he kind of does like the Mythbusters for magicians, right? He kind of debunks some of the things that are going on. But they're writing a book about his life. And in the book, they tell the story about how every day during the height of his career, he would get up and take a little slip of paper out of his wallet, tear it up, and write a new slip of paper and put it in his wallet. And on the slip of paper, he would write, Today, I, the great Randini, <laughs> or whatever his real name was, uh, on, let's say, today's date, October 13th, 2019, am going to die. And he would put it in his wallet. And every day he would take the slip of paper out and write a new one and put it in there. Because he was trying to carry on the myth of his greatness, even in death. That he was able to predict his own death. What would you write on a slip of paper like that? What would you write? If you were thinking about the people that you leave behind, what would you put in your wallet? When you're gone, what would you want them to look at as they pull that little slip of paper out of your purse? Would it be believing in Jesus Christ has made the world of difference? Would it be I, I was not ashamed of the gospel. God changed me. What would it be? Well, let's explore this together over the next few weeks, shall we? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to say thank you for the way in which you have blessed us as a church. You bless us as a church with people who know the scriptures. God, I'm so grateful for those who know their Bibles so well, better than I do. 
Lord, I've been, I've been to Bible college and seminary and uh, even working on a doctorate, and there are people who know their Bibles better here than I do. That is just awesome to me. And it is good to know because your word shapes character. Father, I pray that you would allow us as your people to know your word so well that we become so much like you that people would look at us and go, I see Jesus in you. Lord, help us to point out the way in which you've gifted some and encourage that. Never, never be ashamed of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.